Hey everybody, welcome to another interview at 101 Art School. Today we are interviewing Ilza Khort, an illustrator and amazing artist. Ilza, please say hello to everybody. Hi everyone, thank you awesome. for having me. Yeah, great. So Ilza, tell us a little bit about where you live and what you do. Uh, well, I am a freelance fantasy illustrator from the Netherlands. I'm 31 years old. I've been in the industry for about 10 years now. Amazing. And yeah. doing mostly game art and book covers and private commissions. Awesome. So yeah, we've, we've been essentially in the industry for about the same time. So I'm not going to ask your age. Oh. I'm just going to assume you're fashionable like I am. <laughs> so um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about um, what got you started in your journey to art. Um, what got me started? Uh, Pokemon, actually. Hmm. I, <laughs> I mean, if we're going all the way back to the, the very, very, very beginning, uh, I was 10 years old. I remember this because I wrote down the dates uh, under the drawings that I made. Uh, I was 10 years old and I started copying uh, Pokemon from the, you know, the pogs that we used to get in chips, yes, like I crisp do. bags. I do remember chips that. Bags. Yes. Uh, and like, I was way into Pokemon as a kid and I, I was like, you know what? I, these seem like I could draw them and I would try to draw them so that I could draw my own Pokemon. So that was what I set out to do. <laughs> and so I started, uh, got about 10 Pokemon in and then I got bored, but by then, you know, like I was already drawing. And so I started just doing other stuff, but I kept, kept on doing it. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's where it started when I was a kid. Amazing. So I, I suppose starting with Pokemon is such a great place to start because the forms are simple and you can just concentrate yes. on maybe moving a few poses around and just kind of feeling into like this abstract stylized, uh, a creature that isn't really based on well it's kind of based on some reality but then some of it is really sort pushed. of yeah loosely yeah. loosely yeah uh, but yeah I, I um you know like you didn't really need a tutorial or anything it's just like look at the shapes copy them and just make something up yeah so that was a a good place to start yeah agree yeah it's like I don't know if you've seen that meme where it's like let's draw an owl and it draws like three circles and <laughs> draw the rest of the yeah and it's like owl. exactly and I feel like with yes. the Pokemon it's like well it's not that far from drawing a few circles it's it's really not no it's like once you have the circle down you're all you're almost there already exactly so, yeah so I mean Ilza you're quite known for I guess your your um animals and your artwork and your creature design and that kind of stuff did that mm -hmm. kind of spawn out of the whole pokemon thing or did you kind of go a little bit deeper after that in, in, in for, for your own reasons um no i definitely think that the, the the fascination with the creatures especially because obviously pokemon has people too uh and i remember some of my friends who also kind of started dabbling in art a little bit like they drew the people but i always only wanted to draw the creatures because they're just so much cooler uh, I was always a little bit of a dragon girl, so obviously started drawing dragons shortly after that. Uh, picked up James Gurney's Dinotopia uh, a few years later, which is still, James Gurney is still one of my main inspirations. Uh, and, you know, like dinosaurs, also a big fan. And so like, yeah, creatures has just kind of always been my thing, like animals. I've always been the animal girl growing up. So yeah, that's just me. Yeah, That's and I mean, interest. I, I, I can totally see the James Gurney influence in your art, not only from, I mean, just amazing rendering and painting, but I think also um, I see like the way you interpret scales, even onto mammals. Sometimes you kind of do this hybrid in your artwork that is just so cool. And I guess it is from that dinosaur influence that you had early on. And then the dragon stuff as well, kind of seeping into that. Uh, so you enjoy doing hybrid stuff as well, like, but like absolutely like, it's so cool because like now you get to kind of incorporate that incorporate that knowledge and that that look and feel into the kind of professional artwork that you're doing today yeah absolutely like being able to take any creature basically any creature design and make it look and feel kind of alive like that's that's what i always wanted to do and i'm getting there i i still feel like i have things to learn high praise to you know tell me that the influence is apparent uh, because yeah, no, it's uh, that's that's what I want. Like I want to kind of the same way that Gurney, you know, like can take a creature or a dinosaur or anything really like a scene and really make it look like you're there and you can yeah. basically reach out and feel it. Like that's yeah, that yeah, is, that's, uh, magic. that's what I want. I mean, that's yeah. what I want in my work. Yeah, yeah. Reading through Dinotopia, if anybody hasn't like done themselves the service, like please go do that. Um, it's amazing because it it really feels like a living, breathing world. And even though I guess James is more of a like traditional artist, um, mm -hmm. it feels like he's so immersed in the idea of creating worlds, you know, in those books. And it's just like, man, this is so cool. And of course, that was our influence at, at the age that you and I were becoming artists massively. Yeah. So um, yeah. one of my favorite things to do uh, in these interviews is take a look at artists' old work just to kind of 
uh, get a sense for, you know, a lot of people will see the kind of work that you're putting up now and in your portfolio and even professionally and kind of get this impression like, wow, this is godlike artist. Like, how do I get to that level? It's yeah. kind of hard to like unravel the complexities of the kind of work that you're doing now. But I, I feel like if we look at some of your old stuff, we can maybe see a progression. So um, let's jump into some of that. Um, Ilza has been kind enough to share um, her old work with us. I'm going to try and share my screen effectively here, the right one, hopefully. <laughs> and here we go. So we have um, your Twitter page where you've kept a record of some of your old works. I'm just going to jump right in, right? This is 2004. Oh, day, right? day mode. <laughs> no, this is this yep. is good stuff, right? This is good. Okay, so early influence of dragons, right? It's happening. This is post Pokemon, right? Um, yeah. Why don't you tell me a little bit about this one? <laughs> I couldn't tell you much about it, honestly. This is so this is though, because obviously it has like abs and stuff. I think this was where <laughs> I tried to do a hybrid kind of for the first time, or like one of the first times. It's like, oh, this is like a humanoid dragon, but I had no idea. I hadn't drawn people much at all. So it's basically just a dragon with abs. That's so good. For some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I made that particular choice, but it's it's, it's good. And and nipples. Can we talk about that for a second? <laughs> I think we're uh, underselling so, okay. the nipples. Um, one thing, though, I will say, like a lot of my dragons, I always imagine them to be mammals instead yeah. of reptiles. Mm. So I, I guess there's that. But like, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of make it look anthro, I guess, like part human. So that's just I didn't even think about it. I think it gave it nipples. This is yeah. such an old drawing. I must have been 14. So, so one of the, one of the things I think I in particular find impressive with your work, and and there is definitely a progression that we'll get into later, where we see this starting to come into your work more and more, is like I think even early on you had the desire for foreshortening, but you struggled with it at this point. Like you putting oh, yeah. you're putting it in, but just struggling with it. But I feel like with the next few pieces, like you start to like say like okay, what happens if I if I push my drawing away from just the front? facing image right and so you start to get into like a little bit more of that a little bit more of the foreshortening here mm -hmm. but really where it starts to take off and by the way that the anthro influence is so strong here with this one right it's a complete hybrid <laughs> um i feel like here's where you start to go like i want to study anatomy i want to be a creature artist but i'm yep. still limited to that side profile but you're going deeper with it this time you're actually inventing so much here that's going on yeah i was 16 here i believe and like yeah this is where I think a, a year after this or so is when I realized that like oh I might be able to actually you know do something with this make money off of it so I started getting a little bit more serious here uh, definitely and horses a uh, big influence in my work as well like I've always loved uh, horse art for whatever reason my parents are not into art at all uh, mm. but they have some paintings in their house of horses don't know why but like you know those paintings have definitely I think also influenced me because uh, just horses are very elegant, interesting creatures and kind of a infamous challenge for a lot of artists, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to draw horses just really well. Absolutely. And the anatomy, once you know horse anatomy, I mean, it kind of backwards engineers into all the other animals a little bit as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's very good to know. So, I mean, there's a side profile there and here you're just getting super creative, super fantastical, like breaking out of the mold of something that we know. And now you're starting to experiment with what we don't know. This was a commission, so this was not my design, uh, but it was somebody else's design that they paid me to draw. This was one of my first commissions, actually, I think. Oh, awesome. Well, so, there you yeah. go, guys. That's what a first commission should look like. <laughs> Gets work. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so for me, like, there's such a huge jump between, I don't know what this is, 2007 to 2008. Are you, like, to me, that's like, are you serious? Because, like, this is, like, light years ahead. Like, this is yeah, hard. So now it's like I'm playing with foreshortening. Yeah, so that's what I that's what I said when uh, you know I was sixteen, and about a year later, I started getting really serious. So this is two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. um, this is when I really started studying. Like I, I really started observing not just like other people's art, but also you know um, nature, like the world around me, and really just think about it. Like what am I actually looking at? You know, what shape is it actually? Like what does it look like when a shape comes towards you? Stuff like that. So I started. I didn't quite, you know, grasp it entirely, but I was really paying a lot more attention to what I was doing. Yeah. And at that I think time, that's what you're seeing. Yeah. At that time, did you, um, did you know that this was called the fundamentals, like learning this kind of stuff? Uh, around that time is when I learned that. Yeah. Uh, okay. 2008, I think is when I learned that. 
Awesome. And I mean, it's such a huge jump. The moment, like, I feel like artists start to lean into like what makes something up actually, you know, how can we break it down and then reconstruct it? That's when like this kind of transformation happens, which is so, so cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I mean, here, uh, was, was this around the same time? Yeah. So this was one year later. Uh, and uh, this is definitely where I started trying to do more of, you know, environment. How does the environment affect kind of the creature? Uh, because right. obviously, you know, lighting and everything, like it's, it's yeah. all relations. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is where I tried to yeah. do more elaborate stuff. Yeah. Amazing. Because like, it's so different from your work now. Like the level of control you have now is just insane. And this looks like a kind of like a breakthrough piece. But I, yes. I kind of felt when I first saw it was like, you're trying to do so much in this image that it's it's becoming like, it's almost like an old school fantasy artwork. Like if you went, if you rolled yeah. back to like the eighties where everyone just detailed and painted everything, it kind of yeah. looks like that, but that, that's not a bad thing. I kind of like the retro feel that's coming through here. Yeah. So this piece, uh, the reason why it's so incredibly like overworked is because uh, this piece I made specifically to submit, um, to apply for art school. So for, oh. for the art school that I went to, we needed to make a portfolio, send it in uh, like as an application, they didn't let everyone in. Um, and so this was one of the pieces that I made specifically to show what I can do. And that's why it's so like overdone and over rendered because I, I wanted to just put everything that I had in there. <laughs> and I'm still, you know, it, it was definitely a milestone piece and that I like, I learned a lot. Uh, but yeah, like there's so much I would have done differently now, obviously. Okay. Please tell me they accepted you after this one. Oh, yeah, they did. They yeah, did. of course they did. <laughs> I would. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and so this was this also a part of that? No, no, this was uh, this was one I was already accepted and this was also a commission. Wow, what a cool idea having this little orb of water flowing over the creature. That's great. Yeah, yeah, cool. I had fun with that piece. I remember working on it. <laughs> Yeah. So let's jump into the next series, which is 26, well, 2012 to 2015. I actually yeah. want to stop here on purpose because I'm going to lay over a bunch of your artwork as we talk after this. But I think this is sort of the zone in which you're you're breaking away from, I would say, more traditional, con um, uh, how do you say, compositions, and you're stepping into an entertainment context. Yep. Which is very astute observation because this is where I started doing industry work. This was mm. actually the first piece I did um, for a company that also got me hired. Yeah. And do you, <laughs> so, so at the time of producing this kind of work here, and I'm just going to flip through, um, were you looking at reference uh, in terms of like other artists work and how they were doing industry work? Did that influence you at all? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, okay. A lot. Uh, this Amazing. was specifically splash art. So mm. I was looking at a lot of splash art at the time of like, how do other people do this? And like, yeah. Yeah. How do you and draw focus? Man, look at this. It's like the attention <laughs> to, to detail is starting to improve. And I feel like it's so cool to see you pull figures close to camera, right? Like in, in the past, I feel like they were there, but this is so close. This is like in your face. And mm -hmm. I've noticed with like your later work, which we'll check out later, um, you do tend to kind of play with the foreshortening of things in order to kind of pull detail forward. Um, and then you become like, in a few of your pieces, you, I don't want to say detail obsessed, but like the detail is so gorgeous to look at. Like I, I, I can stare at it for hours. Um, but like right. this right here looks like a massive breakthrough, this whole area, this whole zone. Yeah. So was this over the space of all of these years here? These, what is it? Yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, I don't know which way you look at this, this is 2015, I think, the yeah. last one of this, yeah, yeah. of this group. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. This was um, this was one of the last splash arts that I did for Heroes of New Earth, which is yeah. the company that I worked for at the time. And yeah. like, yeah, this was, uh, when I finished this piece, I was like, wow, you know, I, I remember yeah. sitting back and thinking like, oh, I, I got, like, I'm onto something here. Damn, you um, so are. <laughs> you so are, especially like, here in the face, like this whole section of like lighting and detail and the composition and everything like this would sell to just about anybody as pro work. Even now, like seven years later, you're obviously a much better artist. But like yeah. this to me is like immediately that level at which you hit and go like, I'm pro. Yeah, I'd say so. Even though I was already working professionally for like three, four years here. But yeah, this is where I actually felt like I started becoming an actual professional, I think, in terms of the work that I was making and how confident uh, that I felt in my ability. Yeah. And that's such a weird thing to jump from this idea of like, you know, 
being a professional and feeling a professional. And yes. for a lot of artists, like that takes a while. Sometimes I think maybe forever, like maybe we, doubt, we wake up oh. some days and we just doubt ourselves and we're like, should I be here doing what I'm doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. My imposter syndrome peaked when I got magic work. Oh, geez, I, 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 f- I felt like I'm not ready. I'm not good enough for this, guys. <laughs> yeah. Know. Well, oh, yeah, actually, absolutely. let's talk about that. Let's talk about your magic situation. Like, how did that start? Did, did, did this work get out there and sort of like pull in that work? Did you get attention or did you seek it? Um, uh, so by the time I got magic work, it was actually a, a, a very roundabout way. Um, like I think part of it was that I was already a little bit on the radar, but another thing that happened was that, um, before I got magic work, um, I got hired by valve to do work for artifacts, which is the, the yeah. card game that has completely flopped and died. <laughs> um, but I got hired to do work for artifacts and I worked under, uh, Sandra Everingham, who was the art director for that project. And she then like when the project kind of, you know, went bust or shortly before that she left and went to go work with Wizards of the Coast. And she recommended me internally actually because she worked with me on Artifact and she apparently, you know, had a pleasant enough experience that she went, hey guys, like she's a good artist, like you should check her out. And of course uh, at the time it was Aquaria that they were working on. And Aquaria was the, you know, if any set where I was going to yeah. be brought on, Nailed you know, it. like it, it would have been Aquaria because yeah. yeah, creatures, you know, like, yes, give them to me. Yeah. Like tons <laughs> of anthropomorphic, uh, I hope I'm getting that right, that term, uh, like creature design and just not even that, just monsters in general was like, yeah. yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Know? And just so, like really, yeah. and, and there's a lot of like really pushed designs in terms of like, I think this might be a fox, but it's still like fantasy completely. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. About and they let me go nuts with it. So yeah. yeah, yes. Yeah. For those yeah. watching who don't know, I'm a hardcore Magic fan, and I've been I've been watching a lot of gameplay um, lately, and I've been seeing Ilza's art, and that's actually where I discovered you, to be honest. And that's where I just just like I have to get this woman onto the channel and share her work because it's fascinating, and we need more Magic the Gathering artists on here, honestly, to kind of spread the word of of what's happening there. So, um, yeah. I guess a lot of um, artists aim to be good at painting like one thing. When I look at your artwork, I get the impression that you've kind of spent so much time rendering different things and painting and drawing different things that you've built like a nice rounded sense of what what you can do which is almost anything really in my opinion um how did you train that did you just kind of go into like making entire pieces at a time and learn through doing those pieces or did you kind of spend time like training your skills on the side at the same time no I absolutely learned through doing uh, I've never been very studious in the sense that I'm not very good at like sitting down and studying just doing studies Mm -hmm. um like I've never I've never felt like I've done that I've done that quite a lot but I've never really felt like the information really got absorbed unless I was able to immediately apply it so instead of doing separate studies uh what I did instead was like whenever I made a piece whatever piece doesn't matter um I would bring in like all the references take the time to kind of study whatever I needed to make that piece good Hmm. um do I encounter a new material in this piece then all right I'll I'll go study that material real hard and immediately apply it in the piece and like having you know your studies or your the the thing that you are studying immediately be given a place somewhere and you can see how it all works together for me that made the information like sink in way better so I've always been uh, learning on the job, basically. Okay. So for example, you would get a brief or a period of time to work on an illustration. And as a part of that, you would give yourself some time allowance early on to look up reference. And if there was something that would throw you off, like maybe it's a way of rendering a particular substance, material, light situation, whatever, would you do like a little simulation on the side and then kind of take that directly into your work? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, I, I would more so, uh, yeah, I would collect all the references and then just like throw myself at it in the piece, like say that I need to render something made of gold. Um, I would pull up all the gold references, mm-hmm. place them like around the illustration and then just like paint it again and again and again until I get it right. Okay. Um, okay. So like, yeah, it, I would I would paint it into the illustration, but I would happily like redo it several times until I get the result that I want. Awesome. Okay. So, I mean, being immersed in today's illustrative industry um, and, and kind of working your way up into it uh, from when you started, um, do you feel like the industry is a little bit different today than when you first started? And if so, like, what do you think's changed? Uh, yes. Well, for one thing, I think it's much bigger or it certainly feels much bigger. 
Um, like there's way more people, there's thankfully more diversity. Uh, you know, there's, there's more women, there's more people of color, there's more queer people. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's overall become more, uh, more equal, more tolerant because it was definitely when I started kind of when I became interested, it was very much still a, a men's world and it was still kind of operating under the assumption that, you know, the only people who play games are men aged 16 to 25. Mm. Um, I was explicitly told so in a lot of my marketing jobs. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah, um, it's gotten better in that regard and that, you know, like they care more about just a much wider audience and there's also just more people involved. Um, it, the quality standard has also gone up mm -hmm. <laughs> by, mm -hmm. by quite a bit, I feel like. Um, I, I think the, the, there's more entry jobs but to get to you know the the better paying ones, I think like the the quality standard is is high, very high. Um, okay. If I look at the splash art, for example, that yeah. I did when I started, compared to what splash art looks like today, uh, I would not have gotten work <laughs> with my abilities, you know, if I try to do what I did then uh, today. Yeah. Okay. So so it, with that in mind, like, would you? Like if you were starting out today, what would you like do differently that you didn't maybe do in the in those days? Like looking back, do you ever have like a sense of like if I had concentrated in one area a little bit more, I would have advanced a bit faster? Um, that's really that's a really difficult question to answer because the it's definitely like it's hard for me to kind of think back like okay like what what would I have done now uh, if I was currently struggling to get in somewhere? I do think that if I had the if I had to start again with the knowledge that I have now, I would have done more within my own um, my own interest. Because I think uh, back at back then when I started, I really kind of bent myself to cater to you know industry stuff. Uh, I, I really like wanted to fit into whatever companies were doing, right. and in doing so, kind of ignored I think you know my own voice and my mm -hmm. own creativity and what mm -hmm. drives me. Um, and so that, like, I think if I were to have, like, if I had to do it again, I would focus more on what actually drives me and what I actually want to do. And I think I would still end up eventually doing magic work because that is very much, you know, within my interests. Um, but I would have probably had different jobs along the way and I would probably not have burned out. <laughs> okay, well, dude, you just dropped the bomb. Like, I have to ask you about that. Like, tell me a little <laughs> bit about your burnout. Like, how did that happen? How did you navigate it? Um, so that was in 2015, uh, mid 2015 is when I, I really like hit just uh, a low. I was also having, like, I was in a very stressful situation at home. Mm -hmm. I was, I had, um, moved out with my uh, then boyfriend, now ex, um, and he lost his job. We moved out together in 2014. He lost his job. And so suddenly, you know, like we were planning on mostly living off of his income for the time being while I, because I was at the start of my career, I just finished school. So I was kind of, you know, picking up jobs here and there, but I was still kind of getting started. He lost his income. So suddenly I had to pay for everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, like bam from nothing, make a thousand bucks a month, at least. Uh, yeah. to cover the basic costs and then you know uh, the the rest on top of it so i had to really like you know nose to the grindstone and just like take any job that i can take uh which was on the one hand really good for my just artistic you know growth like i learned mm -hmm. a lot really quickly did a lot of different things uh but it was not good for my mental health um both the home situation was very stressful and also just uh the, the jobs that I took were so incredibly unfulfilling. And one of them that I did, uh, I don't think I can even say what it was, but it basically it was a job that I took that paid pretty well. Um, but I did a lot of work for it. They were long days, long hours, and none of the work that I made got used. None of it. I worked yeah. for five months, I think. On like, so fi it felt like five months of just my hard work was gone you know, like lost yeah. forever. Yeah. And that felt so incredibly like it, it was such a downer. Like I, I felt like I was just working for nothing. Yeah. You know, sure. I was working for money, but like my work didn't mean anything. So mm -hmm. then, and that was kind of the, that was the end of it. Uh, so I quit. I stopped doing game art altogether for a while and started doing private commissions instead to kind of uh, primarily in the furry fandom to kind of regain, you know, to connect again with people who mm. care about art mm. and to feel like I'm not just a cog in a machine, you know, like, right. and that was a very good decision. 
Amazing. Yeah, it's so important to take these really, really healthy choices. And you mentioned that you were working in video games as well, which I didn't know about. Well, I haven't really been exposed to some of that work that you've been doing there specifically. But um, did you work as a concept artist or did you still do illustration within those um, those fields? Uh, I've done concept art as well. I've kind of dabbled in everything. Uh, I've done logo work, you know, like graphic mm -hmm. design. I, I took literally any job that I could take early on. Uh, I wanted to focus on illustration. That has always been kind of my strength and my interest. Um, but yeah, like I, I had the odd concept art job coming my way. And so I would, I did know how to do it. So, you know, like I would, yeah. I would do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like if you've been freelancing, I mean, you, was that working in-house or was that still freelancing? at that time all freelance yeah okay all freelance. Have... Mm -hmm. yeah so i mean could you just enlighten us i mean for those of us who aren't going freelance we're working in-house or maybe we're still aspiring artists like what do you think are the challenges for you personally being a freelance artist and like how have you navigated that over time um well the obvious one i would say is separation of work and personal because mm. obviously you know if you work freelance uh work kind of never stops you know like you you I'm here in my home office, which is just my home. Uh, and it's it's difficult, I think, to like separate the space where you work from the space where you relax. Um, and whenever I was at my computer, which is also where, you know, I play games and I, 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 I chat with people and I browse the internet and all that, um, but this is also where I work. And so whenever I'm on my computer, it's hard to kind of turn off that part of my brain that thinks you could be working. You know, yeah. you could be working right now. Yeah. Um, why aren't you working? And that guilt, that's, uh, guilt, that guilt complex, just that guilt, and the other way around. You know, when you're working, it's like I could be playing games right now. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> I it, could be. <laughs> I could be. Nobody's watching me. You know, my mom's not yeah. here. <laughs> exactly, that's the worst. Yeah. Um. So it's kind of that that two. Yeah, like the double-edged sword of like you 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 have to kind of separate work and personal, and you have to really compartmentalize. You know, like what you're doing. Uh, and that was that was definitely a challenge, I think, for me in the beginning. I'm better at it now. Uh, I kind of, you know, it's it's still a struggle, though. Sometimes it just is. OK, OK, that's cool. And I mean, earlier we were talking about your burnout and how that came about as a result of obviously <clears throat> many factors coming at you at the same time. But one of them was like overworking and putting in like way many way too many hours into your work. And like there's this this thought that comes to my brain of. Like, I know that when a professional sprinter runs, right, he can only maintain the utmost sprint for like four seconds, right, in that yeah. in that entire run. And so he kind of, he or she kind of like figures out where that's going to be in the run and then uses it efficiently. And I can't help but feel yeah. like artists suffer from that too. It's like the moment we push to 10, that, that 10, we can't maintain it long and it tends to like have a negative effect. It makes us go backwards. And that, that price that we pay at the end of that is so vicious. So yeah. my kind of question around that is, I mean, a lot of aspiring artists these days, they're up and coming and they kind of get this impression of like instant gratification in today's world, you know, of everything moving so fast. There's this mm -hmm. feeling of like, hey, I want to be a pro artist. I see other people doing it and they're putting out this great work. And in just like a few years, I'm sure I can get to that level. Do you think that's like a healthy way of approaching art and kind of building out your skills? Or do you think that's detrimental to like your mental health and the process of actually going pro? Um, sorry, I kind of, I had a different thought in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. Could you, re could you uh, repeat the last half of the question? Yeah. So I like mean, the I, part where, yeah. So a, a bunch of artists are like, like aspiring artists today, they kind of feel like their art should be good in a year or two. Like they just have that expectation mm -hmm. of just like moving really quickly in order to get that final goal. Do you think that's healthy or would you recommend slowing down and kind of figuring things out a bit? I would absolutely recommend if you can afford to slow down, slow down, because art is not a speed run. You know, it's it's just not you cannot you cannot do this uh, and get really, really good in, in a short amount of time. It's just not going to happen. Um, I, this is why actually part of the reason why I made that thread on Twitter uh, was to show like just how long I've been doing this. Because I feel like there are like I, I talk a lot with a lot of, you know, I get questions from aspiring artists all of the time. Uh, I'm in a lot of feedback groups where I talk to both beginners and intermediates, you know, people who are kind of entering the industry. Um, and like I, I they look at my work and they get really frustrated that, you know, like, oh, I've been practicing for like three years and I'm not there yet. You know, like it's so frustrating. And I'm like, 
man, like I was, <laughs> I was making art when you were basically an infant, you know, like you're, you need to slow down. Like this is going to take a long time. Um, there, there, like, yeah, you can't speed run this. Like you, you can definitely, you know, like be more efficient with your learning. Um, I, like, you know, I definitely think there are faster ways to grow, uh, but I, I don't think you can get just really good in the span of a few years. Like that's, it's going to take longer than that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I, I it's, yeah, it, it's just so hard to um, deliver that message when the person hearing it hasn't got the sort of time horizon perspective life experience of it, of having at least run through that gauntlet. And it's this weird thing that I keep bringing up of like, whenever you meet another artist that maybe you've seen in the industry or that you um, you like their work, it's like mm -hmm. you could see each other from across the room and just kind of give that slow head nod and just like that, that eye connection and just know that both of you have like gutted yourself to get to that point, right? Would you agree with that? Yes, no, absolutely. Uh, and it's, <laughs> it's difficult to... Uh, I think part of the reason why it's so difficult to impart as well is because like you said before, is like, you know, we're in a time of like instant gratification. Everything moves really fast. Patience is a lost skill, honestly. Um, and it's, uh, I don't blame young people because I, I completely understand, like I'm on social media, you know, I, I see how this works. I see how fast everything goes. I see how people need to make art and four days later, everyone's forgotten about it. You know, and it's like, that's so demoralizing. And I, yeah. I do not envy, you know, because I already have so many years of just having galleries and having forums and, you know, like talking about art and art just existed for longer, you know, a piece that you made just was in the general consciousness for a longer time, yeah. you know, like, whereas today, like art just flashes by and is gone. Yeah. And it's, and it feels, I can imagine that it feels like, why would I put so much time and effort into, you know, getting good when at the end of the day, people are going to see it for a few seconds and it's gone, you know? Um, so yeah, and I don't really have an answer for that. It's like, yeah, like it's it it the current climate is not great. Um, but at the same time, you know, like art hasn't really changed. The way that you need to approach art and how you learn hasn't really changed, you know, like that's not gonna speed up the same way the world around us has. So like, yeah, you're just gonna have to be patient. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, I kind of feel like I totally feel what you're saying because I one of one of my guilty pleasures is I start my day by opening my browser and, and like checking out the um, trending stuff on ArtStation. And I every day it's like a whole new section of just like fat square of just tons of pieces of just like new art and it's all killer. And I just yep. run through that to just see what other artists are doing and how they're thinking and how they're presenting their work. But I feel like it is that moment in time. It's almost like when a baby's born, you just take like a quick snapshot and you walk away, you know, and then that lasting photo has to, is there for like a few seconds. But the truth is that photo will just be like a part of someone's journey. You know, each one of those yes. pieces is a part of someone's gallery. It's part of their their like extended learning process and their, their sort of gift to the world. So I yeah. mean, with that in mind, um, do you feel like the kind of stuff you're doing for magic right now and all this other amazing artwork that you're producing, do you think that um, you have a vision of where you'd like to take your work from here on out? Like, is there a, a, a lane or, or a path that you want to take your work from, from here? Um. Yes, uh, I sort of. It's it's still like I'm still forming it in my mind. Mm. Uh, but I actually really want to go. I've been dabbling a little bit in acrylics uh, in so the past nice. like uh, year, I would say, and I'm really liking it. Um, I think I want to try eventually if I'm ready for it and I have the time. Um, I want to try uh, doing magic work traditionally, and I also just want mm. to like just dabble more in traditional art again because I I'm realizing that that the feel of digital versus the feel of traditional like traditional does just give me a level of satisfaction that right. digital doesn't um and yeah i think that's something that i really want to pursue and then also i'm like curious to see how um doing more traditional work is going to influence my digital work because i do think it will like it will change the way that i approach illustrations because i have a very you know i have a process now that's i i it's a trusted process it mm -hmm. works I use it basically every time, um, but I do feel like the because I have such a set process where I just get the result roughly that I want, um, I'm not really approaching it differently anymore. You know, like I, I get the same roughly results every time. There's no happy accidents anymore because it's so controlled. Uh, and so like I want to push into traditional and see like how that 
is because I do think that's going to change like, you know, my approach and refresh it a little bit and give me some new perspectives. And yeah. Yeah. And I feel like it gives you permission because it's so, it's so much slower in a sense that like when we, when we take digital, um, you know, when we, we sort of look at digital and we get this impression of like, I can just pick any color right? The color, the whole palette's there. Yep. I can just grab it and I can work with that. And like, maybe you'll create like a gamut for yourself or something. But with traditional, I feel like it's like, hey, let me go buy that one color and just maybe experiment on the next piece, you know? And then that color mm -hmm. has been like, you know, the pigment has come from some like crazy mountain or something, you know, <laughs> where it's just like unique and you can't find that color unless you just like, you can't even photo the color like, like correctly, you know, that becomes the next issue. And so yeah. like, yeah, I think that is such a, um, a true and interesting um, way of seeing it. I, I, one of my favorite magic artists is uh, Jesper Ising. And yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, and like I look at his work and I love his color and I love how vibrant it is and I love the way he approaches his paintings and I love watching him peel away his masking layers and it's just like yeah. deeply, deeply oh. satisfying. <laughs> the tape removal videos is just ah oh, yes. <laughs> so please guys, satisfying. if you guys aren't following him on, on Instagram, please go check his stuff out and like watch those videos. They're deeply satisfying. Um yes. so I mean, based on your own experience up until now, your whole career, let's like, you know, blow it up and, 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 and really ask you, like, if you could recommend any advice to young aspiring artists who want to do the kind of things that you want to, that you're doing currently and to break into that industry today, um, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? Like, if they're just starting out, like what kind of path should they start thinking about like growing their skills through? Well, I mean, it's such a, <laughs> I feel like it's such a common sense piece of advice, but make the art that you want to make you know if you want to do magic art then try to make art that looks like magic art you know it's it's um like i see a lot of people um or at least i've come across quite a number of people i've done some portfolio reviews as well who mm -hmm. say that they want to work for magic but their gallery doesn't reflect that whatsoever you know it's like there's nothing here like your illustrations are in like completely not card formats like they're not really depicting anything that i would expect to see on a magic card it's like you know if you want to do magic work make work like magic work you know like study uh, magic art and like take even literally just the card proportions and like build your compositions within you know card size uh, make sure that it reads well from a distance make sure that like pick a clear subject matter uh, because obviously the cards are always like you know they have an obvious kind of target it's either a creature or a spell or something like that um you know like take one or even take literally a magic card and redraw it you know like redesign it um so yeah like if make the art that you're like that you want to make work towards the kind of style and quality that you're trying to achieve you know if you have an end goal that's perfect you have all the reference you could possibly need like just look at all the work that is out there that kind of you want to your art to fit amongst and then work in that direction yeah that's great advice thank you so much um last question is are you ever going to put together an art book for us to buy uh, yes <laughs> tentative yes now, i absolutely want to and i've been planning to for probably five years now um but yes i will eventually get around to making an art book amazing please tell me first so that i can spread the word and buy it myself <laughs> <laughs> will do <laughs> awesome thank you so much ilza for your time guys if you want to check out some of ilza's work please look in the in the description and of course i'm going to lay over some links here as well for her instagram her art station all that good stuff uh ilza thank you so much and i'll chat to you later thank you cheers cheers Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this interview today. If you found the information useful, do give me a like and a subscribe and make sure that you hit the notification bell so that you can get updates as to when I post next. It really helps the YouTube algorithm and it really helps me reach more artists just like you. Thanks.